On this episode of Missouri Life, we're in the Lake of the Ozarks. I'm Meredith Haynes. Thanks for joining me on another exploration of Missouri life. Today, we embark on an adventure at the one and only Lake of the Ozarks. We'll learn how engineers harness the power of a river. We'll catch a show on Main Street, explore the ruins of a once ambitious dream, rediscover the mysteries of a Native American cave, experience water sports firsthand, and much, much more. Today, you might need a life jacket for Missouri life. The Lake of the Ozarks is massive, spanning approximately 61,000 square miles and reaching depths of 130 feet. The creation of this expansive lake was no small undertaking. Bagnell Dam, the powerhouse responsible for the lake, was completed in 1931 to supply electricity across Missouri. Meredith? Hi. Hi, Phil Thompson, I'm the plant manager here at the dam beautiful Lake of the Ozarks. Welcome. Thanks for having us. We're excited about this tour that not a lot of people get to have these days. We're glad to have you here today to show you around. And it, it's a busy day. It's a busy day. <laughs> Come on in. I've got a hard hat for you, some safety glasses. Okay. Come on in. We'll take a tour. So Meredith, these blue covers that you're seeing are the covers over the top of the turbine generators. Up on top on this deck up above where you can see all the power lines coming in, yeah. those are our transformers that we have. Uh, the insulating material normally for a transformer is oil, but we use uh, a material called sulfur hexafluoride gas. We were always concerned about oil leaks or, or a, uh, a failure of the transformer in some way that would allow oil to run to the river. So when it came time to replace those transformers, we replaced them with an environmentally friendly transformer. The machinery is very well balanced. So even though you do feel a little bit of vibration, there's about 250 tons rotating that's, uh, that's very finely balanced. So you really don't get a lot of big vibration, just a little bit of vibration in the concrete. Yeah, it's minor, but you can feel it. You can feel it, for sure. <laughs> we operate three different power stations uh, from this control room, all are hydro power plants. When it comes to that, how much water are we talking? Uh, I think we were around 250,000 cubic feet per second on the Mississippi River. The main generators are, uh, uh, can produce about 240 megawatts. Uh, the last set of screens over here are for controlling our house service units. And our house service units are small units. Uh, they're only about four megawatts apiece. Uh, but they perform a special function. That's the black start function for the grid. So if there happened to be an electrical blackout, a grid blackout, uh, this power plant would be responsible for providing startup power for other power plants to kind of piggyback up to build power back up onto the grid. Somebody has to be in here all the time, I'm imagining. We man the power plant 24-7, 365. There has been uh, operators here busy taking care of this power plant and these generators continually. This plant has never been unmanned uh, since uh, 1929. What would be next on a tour? Uh, well, let's go downstairs and we'll take a look at what we call our turbine deck downstairs okay. and we'll be able to see the turbine shaft rotating. So Meredith, this is the turbine deck. So each one of our turbines are down below, but all eight units are basically the same. We still are running two original turbines from 1930, uh, but six of the units we've upgraded to get a higher power rating. We see one of the... Yeah, right in here is, uh, is one of the turbine shafts spinning. So the, again, the generator's up above, the turbine's down below, and it's connected by this 30-inch solid steel shaft uh, that weighs about 50 tons that connects these two components. The turbine is surrounded in the water passage, so as the water flows through, all that water has to be encapsulated in, a, in what we call our penstock. 
this is an example over here of one of what we call our governor oil pump motors. That motor has been running continuously for over 86 years. We take it out of service about once a year just to blow the dust out of it, turn it back on, and it continues to run. It's never had a winding failure or a bearing failure, so they really overbuilt everything and they built it to last. Uh, this is our machine shop. We've got some, some industrial sized drills, milling machines, surface grinders. Uh, over here we've got some original uh, 1930 machinery that we still use. And they still work. They still work. They work very well. What do you do in this shop? What is it that you would be taking care of? So many of the parts and components for a 1930 machine are not readily available off the shelf. Shocking. So we have to build these parts ourselves for sure. Well, you have a great view of the dam. It's a great place to work. I've been here a little over 20 years and uh, I've never gotten tired or bored with all the work that we do. Well, thank you so much for the tour. Thank you. Thank you. Great to have you here. The Lake of the Ozarks has a rich history that precedes even the lake itself. We caught up with historian Dr. Victoria Hubble to shed some light on how this Missouri staple came to be. The Osage River Project dammed actually three rivers, the Osage, the Niangua, and the Glaze. But originally the Osage River and the other contributing rivers just wandered from bluff to bluff. So there was a lot of farmland down there. Originally the economy was devastated because the real economy of the area were the river bottom farmers. However, uh, after the depression lifted and, the, and people could start visiting the area, then the economy, although very different, rebounded and then became much more productive than it was before. Building the dam, people say it took two years, but actually it took a lot longer than that because they had to plan and they had to buy up all the land. And they had to put coffer dams in place just to back up the river and hold it while they constructed the magnificent you know, construction that we see as we can drive over and sit back and look at. The name of the lake, as it was given by the Missouri legislature, was Lake Benton. And they named it after one of their favorite senators. People in Missouri didn't like it. They just kept calling the new lake, Lake of the Ozarks. And as far as I know, it was never officially changed, but everyone always calls it Lake of the Ozarks. The lake is huge, and because the shoreline is so convoluted, we actually have more miles of shoreline here than the state of California. Going even deeper into the heart of the Ozarks, we visit Bridal Cave. Abundant with rock formations millions of years old, it's one of the most scenic caves in the United States. Tour guide Steve Thompson takes us deep underground to witness these breathtaking structures. Hi, I'm Meredith. Hi, Meredith. I'm Steve. Welcome to Bridal Cave. It's so nice to meet you. You know, I've been a Missourian my entire life and I've never been here. Well, you're about to see one of the prettiest caves around. Can we go? Yeah, let's go. Okay. The entire cave's about a mile long, but we only oh. tour a quarter mile of it because the back section has some big lakes. When did people start coming into the cave? The cave's been famous since the 1850s because of its formations and colors. It wasn't protected till 1948. That's when they opened it up for tours. Okay, let's go into the bridal chapel. This is probably the most famous room of the cave. Okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know why I think mammoth tooth when I see it. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. That's actually called the pipe organ formation, and yeah. this is where we perform all of the weddings. Uh, this stalagmite here is actually called the natural altar, and this is the bridal chapel where we've had over 3,762 weddings. So this, while this is one of the probably best known rooms of the cave, yes. um, you're saying there's other rooms that are just as dramatic and as beautiful to come? Even, uh, even more so. We'd, I'd like to go see those. Well, let's go see some more. <laughs> Not that I couldn't stand in here. Besides the wedding, the cave is famous for two other things. One is the sheer abundance of formation and its natural colors. We only use a white LED lighting system, so all the colors you see are natural. The white is calcium, the red is iron oxide, the blue-green is copper, the gray is manganese, and a little bit of black is lead. So the water brings in the minerals, they mix together, and that's what makes all the colors of the formation. This room has so much more. Oh, there's more to see. Okay. Let's go. 
As we uh, made the tunnels, we didn't know in these passageways that there were actually some uh, subterranean rooms that had never been seen before. Oh Here's one here. Those are. So whose idea was it to say, okay, let's dig a cave, let's dig a tunnel? That'd be me. No, oh, no way. Yeah. Oh, now that is beautiful. Now this is the what's called the big room of the cave. It is the largest single room. Uh, it's about 300 feet end to end. Uh, the ceiling in this room is about 110 feet, but there's actually 30 feet of room below us. We're actually over the underground lake right now. When you turn around. Pretty impressive. That is breathtaking. So literally everywhere you look, there's something to see. Let's go back to the lake. That water's about 18 feet deep, so you're seeing all the way down to the bottom. It's crystal clear. Now here's Mystery Lake. Now look real close down there in the water. You can kind of see what looks to be like an old scaffolding yeah. or a bridge or a ladder. We did not know that was there until we put the lights back here and opened this part of the cave. There is no underwater passageway into this room. And this is all captured drip water. There's no water coming running in from the outside. There's no life, no fish, no crawfish or anything in it. All the water you're seeing came one drip at a time from the formations above it. Some of those timbers are six by eight by 20 feet long. We can't find anybody alive that knows why that's back there. So that's why it's called Mystery Lake. Can you take it out and, and We date sent it? divers down to it and tried to date it. And when they grabbed it, it just melted. As a matter of fact, there was a whole nother section on this end. And when the divers swam up to it, it just melted. So we haven't let any other divers in since then. This is beautiful. I, you love your job, don't you? I do. I started here as a tour guide 44 years ago, my senior year in high school, and I've been here ever since. And it's just one of the coolest jobs. I get to meet people from all over the world. It's like working at a national park. And this is my office. I thank you for giving us this tour. It's oh, beautiful. it's our pleasure. We love showing it off. Come see Bridal Cave. It's gorgeous. The beauty of the Lake of the Ozarks, above and below the surface, has called many Missourians and others from across the country to make this place a second home. One of the first second homes began construction in 1905, built by wealthy businessman Robert Snyder here in what is now called Ha Ha Tonka State Park. Ha Ha Tonka State Park is one of Missouri's most rich uh, state parks in the terms of cultural and natural history and how they interact with each other. Uh, we have special features such as our Oak Woodland Natural Area, all the way up to cultural features such as here at the Snyder Estate. The Snyder Estate is an area where a wealthy Kansas City businessman named Robert McClure Snyder, he came down to visit the area in 1903 and he wanted to make like a getaway home. Uh, he never got to see it completed. He died about a year after construction began in one of Missouri's first automobile accidents, but his sons did finish the estate in roughly 1922. As time went on, they sort of lost interest in the, uh, the property and they leased it out to a lady by the name of Miss Josephine Ellis. She operated as like a bed and breakfast. And then one, you know, unfortunate day, October 1942, one of the employees was building a fire on one of the many fireplaces and sparks from the chimney landed on the cedar shake roof and it went up like jet fuel and it burned for several days, several nights. Down below the Snyder State, over a 200-foot bluff, we have Missouri's 12th largest spring. Um, if you're wanting an exciting outdoor adventure, Ha Tonka would be the perfect place. We have a little over 17 miles worth of hiking trail, uh, going through some of Missouri's finest examples of glades and woodlands in our large oak woodland natural area. We have some of the finest examples of karst in the state, and as well as all the cultural aspects being uh, the Snyder State and the Native American occupation of the area. Visitors from around the world come to the Lake of the Ozarks to explore its rich history and beautiful landscape, many of which seek out unique flavors this community has to offer. Will Moore, our flavor guide, visits Wobbly Boots Roadhouse to sample some hearty mid-Missouri barbecue recipes. Where does the name Wobbly Boots come from? That's really unique. Yeah, no, I wasn't quite sure. It, it's kind of a fun name, um, and it was just a silly story I heard on the radio. Uh, a professional golfer named Steve Elkington was talking about some friends of his going on a trip, and when they got off the airplane, one of his friends had drank so much beer he had on his Wobbly Boots. So it, <laughs> it just cracked me up, and uh, and it just kind of went well with barbecue. So I just went with it. Okay. All right. So what do we got here? Uh, these are our uh, pulled pork nachos. So it's got our uh, hickory smoked pulled pork on there, our uh, homemade uh, spicy nacho cheese, uh, pepper cheese sauce, 
and uh, red onions and tomatoes, and it's got our uh, house-made baked beans on there too, which really make it special. Uh, we uh, use our barbecue rub, and, and we rub the uh, pork shoulders, and, um, and then we put them on our smoker with some good old Missouri hickory, and we smoke it for about 15 hours at 220 on our smoker. 15 hours. Yeah. Now that packs in the flavor, doesn't it? It does. It gets that smoke in there really good and it, and it breaks down, you know, pork shoulders usually kind of a tough cut, mm -hmm. but that's the barbecue process, breaks it down, makes it real tender, juicy, and it gives that flavor. Yeah. This is a true barbecue nacho. This is beautiful. Just beautiful. Oh, it's about to get messy. <laughs> Well, that was amazing. We've absolutely decimated. <laughs> but I'm excited to see what's next. What well, we good. I see Luke coming this way. We've got the ah, Texas two-step. Right. That's got our brisket on it and uh, the smoked sausage. And then I've got some uh, spare ribs here. This is a massive sandwich. <laughs> yes. Wow, and I'm supposed to pick this up? Yeah, you might have to work your way to that. It, it, it's uh, maybe eat a little bit and then make it into the sandwich. Well, I like to go full force into it. I'm gonna go ahead and give it a shot here. All right, wish me, wish me luck. <laughs> All right. What do you think? <laughs> Enough said. That's great. Yeah. That's awesome. So I've got the Texas two step. What do you got here? These are the classic spare ribs. So we do the barbecue rub on these also, and then we smoke these for about five to six hours. And then what about our sides here? So you got the fresh made coleslaw. We do that in small batches, so it's always fresh. And then I've got our house made potato salad, and uh, it's got some eggs in it, some red potatoes. Really good. It's a perfect barbecue meal, it looks like. So how would you define your barbecue? You know. In Missouri, we have Kansas City barbecue, we have St. Louis barbecue. You're kind of in yeah, the middle. We're, yeah, and, that, and it, I'd say probably a little bit more leaning towards Kansas City, but kind of a hybrid. And we use a tomato-based sauce, uh, which is more the Midwestern style. Uh, and then just the, the cut of the ribs and, and uh, the sides that you serve and stuff like that. You got any more napkins? <laughs> we can hose you off in the back. <laughs> oh, great. That would be perfect. So one last question. What do you love so much about Wawa? <laughs> There's a few things I love about Wawa Boots. I love the employees here. When you come in here, it doesn't matter if you've been here 100 times or it's your first time, you feel at home, you feel welcome, and they're, and they're professional and friendly, and they know what they're talking about. And then the food that they bring you is the best. Absolutely. Yeah, and so <laughs> that, that is great. And then the atmosphere, it just all comes together and makes this a fun, great place to be. I couldn't possibly eat another bite as much as I really want to. <laughs> I could probably eat two more of these Time if for I really put my mind <laughs> up. But yeah, I'm going to waddle on back to the car and move on to the next one. But thank you so much. Thank you, Will. This has been awesome, and uh, I wish you all the best success. The Lake of the Ozarks is rich in flavor, experiences, and culture. Sometimes the quickest way to get around is by boat. That is unless you stop along the way to drop a line. Amateur bass fishing champion Marcus Sikora took us out to some of his favorite spots. What I love about Lake of the Ozarks in the Ozark region is we got four distinct seasons, right? So where my favorite spot is right now yeah. could be in the next season coming fall, could be you know, 30 miles from here. So you don't get, my point is, you don't get the level of redundancy. People are like, how do you fish the lake all the time and so much, and don't you get tired of it? Well, everything changes all the time, so no. I've never, I've never seen two years in a row where my favorite spot was the same. It's got a tremendous uh, crappie population, right? There's a lot of people that love to eat crappie. I think crappie's probably the best eating freshwater fish there is, and, uh, Catfish, crappie, bluegill, um, there's walleye in the extremities, there's smallmouth in the extremities, uh, you know, big snagging season for spoonbill. And uh, if you could do this for a living, who wouldn't want to do it, right? Well, I thank you for taking the time and bringing me out today. Sure. Absolutely. And I didn't break. You didn't break anything. I didn't break anything. You come back anytime. Oh, all right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't have much luck catching a big one, but it was nice to feel the breeze on the open water in Marcus's boat. However, it didn't quite match the horsepower of some of the other boats found here on the lake. 
Performance Boat Center manufactures some of the fastest and most powerful boats in the world right here at the Lake of the Ozarks, turning a casual lake fishing cruise into an adrenaline-filled white-knuckle joyride. Performance Boat Center is the world's largest high-performance boat dealership. Uh, located in Osage Beach, Missouri, we uh, buy, sell, trade, service, paint, and rig uh, the world's most elaborate performance boats. The boats we were talking about are uh, Wright Performance Boats. It's a collaboration between Doug Wright and his company and Performance Boat Center. Doug and his team build these hulls and decks, assemble them in Melbourne, Florida, and um, our expertise is in the finish work. So we bring the boats up extremely bare. We bring them over to our building here in Osage Beach, Missouri. We sand them, prime them, and paint them, and then we move them over to our rigging department, put the interiors in them, the sound systems, all electrical, mount the motors, uh, windshields, that kind of thing, and finish them, and then we retail them out of Missouri. The customer is picking out every line, every color, every stripe, um, all the look, feel. Um, so if they're 100% custom, there's not two of them, not even close to being the same. We not only work on boats, we actually crew our own race team, we drive it all over the country, working on our spare time so that all of our other projects stay on, on task. But we go out there, we show the, the, you know, the nation and the, and the crowd what we can do with the boats and actually brings us in some business. We keep eight or nine of the, of the world's most expensive boats here in the showroom. There's always some cars laying around and it's open to the public. So uh, folks will come in, they'll park a pontoon, they'll go have a burger and a beer over at Redhead Lakeside Grill and come over here and get to check out some of the coolest boats in the world, literally in the world. We're always doing demos. I've always got boats in the water that, that we can take somebody out in. So it's a full experience. You can, you can be into boating or just want to come by and check it out. And we're very accommodating and we welcome people to come in and check it out. And, because we're into it. You have to be into it to be in this business. So it's a, it's a lifestyle and I spent all day long yesterday out boating. I'm gonna maybe boat tonight if this weather blows out and take my parents' pontoon in on Tuesday. So that's what we're about. Fishing and powerboat racing are just a couple of examples of the exciting activities on the lake. But now it's time to get in the water. Kirby Leisman of Kirby School of Wake offered to give me a lesson in wakeboarding. Needless to say, He's got his work cut out for him. Kirby, tell me, when we go out to wakeboard, is this a good time or a bad time to be on the water for a first timer? This is the perfect time. Okay. Yeah. So we're in good shape here, because right before, before dark, it seems like most of the people are going in for dinner, the wind's kind of laying down. Now this is the perfect time to go wakeboard or wake surf. This is a career, but you still chase that adrenaline rush with wakeboarding, you still compete. Certainly, yes, yeah, so I compete a few times a year now, and uh, it's a lot of fun being able to put my skills to the test in that competitive setting, and yeah, see how they, how they rank up versus the other professional wakeboarders on the circuit. Well, I'm ready to get this show on the road and find out my fate. <laughs> we'll see if I succeed or not. Are you ready? Great, absolutely. <laughs> Let's get you out there. You've already experienced two of the three steps for being able to get up on the wakeboard. All right. Okay, you did the rolling forward part and the standing. Okay, so now it's just the part where you have to kind of crunch and you stay in this position the whole time. Hold that position, hold, 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 and stand. Perfect, and step forward. Great, you're gonna do off. Awesome. Last thing, I'm gonna give you this helmet so you and I can communicate while you're back there wakeboarding. Hey, Barry, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, you're faint, but I hear you. So just keep your knees bent, uh, your back kind of crunch, you know, kind of crunch forward a little bit. Okay. Hold that position, and then the boat will hoist you right out. Here we go. You ready? Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're going to hold that position. Stay tucked in a tight ball. Hold that. Good. Now gently lean back against that rope. Okay, need to stand up a little. <laughs> Woo! <Thanks> nice. <laughs> No big deal. You are so, up. you're such a positive person. <laughs> no, you're doing awesome. You gotta have a couple outtakes. If you did it first try, it'd look like a stage. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Excellent, you're there. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Hey, thanks for coming out. Usually you did so awesome. Nicely done. Thank you. You're a very good teacher. I appreciate that. <laughs> hey, 
There truly is something for everyone here at the Lake of the Ozarks, a vacation destination. It's a short trip from just about anywhere in the state, whether for an extended stay or a weekend getaway. You can splash around at Big Surf Water Park in the wave pool or slide down one of the many thrilling rides. For some evening entertainment, there's a variety of shows and live music like the family-friendly Main Street Music Hall. Here, the wonderful cast performs classic tunes beloved by all, and you might even get some stage time of your own. If you would like a more luxurious vacation experience, resorts like Margaritaville or the Lodge of Four Seasons might be more your speed. Book a room to experience warm hospitality and a picturesque waterfront view. For everyone at Missouri Life Magazine and myself, thanks for watching and tune in next time to spark your spirit of discovery and discover Missouri Life. Missouri Life Magazine explores and celebrates the people, places, history, and destinations that make our state unique. Subscriptions to Missouri Life Magazine are available at MissouriLife.com. For exclusive content, full episodes, and much, much more, subscribe to the Missouri Life channel on YouTube and enjoy the journey at your own pace. Catch a show on Main Street, explore the ruins of an ambitious dream. Sorry. <laughs> I'm afraid one of you is going to fall off. <laughs> Here at the Lake of the... I was really Miss America on that one. And sunscreen. <laughs> and real peace. <laughs> hey, Austin, is it time to go? Okay. I'm just f***ing with you. My name's Marcus. And you keep calling me Mark, so I'm going to start calling you Austin. <laughs> Welcome to Bagnell Dam! Woo! It's a short trip from just about anywhere in the state. Whether for a weekend getaway, I'm about to fall. <laughs> Nervous. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, this is... Water sports has never been my strong suit. It is today.